bright and beautiful music. This is KIXI Dial 91 AM or 96 FM, Seattle. The FBI and New York Congressman John Rooney are denying a New York Times story which says that J. Edgar Hoover, the late director of the FBI, tried to, give Rooney, tried to help Rooney get re-elected by supplying him with sensitive information about his political opponent. This is Ann Crosman reporting on the CBS radio network. The New York Times quotes what it calls a well-placed source as saying that Hoover gave that kind of information to Rooney and other congressional supporters of Hoover. Rooney heads a House Appropriations Subcommittee, which exercises authority over the FBI budget. According to the Times, Rooney's subcommittee has invariably approved the FBI's proposed budget. The FBI categorically denies the Times report, and Rooney calls it a lot of nonsense. The FBI in Atlanta says its big break in the Reg Murphy kidnapping case came when a Miami resident called, saying that he was approached by a man in the same way that Murphy was approached. The Miami resident, W. Charles Becker, has identified that man as William Williams, the same person arrested in the Murphy case. Sharon Lovejoy has more on the case from Atlanta. The FBI still will make no official comment about the number of people involved in the kidnapping of Reg Murphy or whether they've confirmed the existence of an organization called the American Revolutionary Army. They do say agents are now checking out new leads in the case, some of which came from a diary found in one of William Williams' cars the day he and his wife were arrested. The diary, originally located by CBS News, mentioned several contacts the suspect made with the Saudi Arabian Embassy in Washington. For Reg Murphy, it partially supported comments Williams made about his involvement with a foreign government. He said that he had gone to the embassy in Washington because he knew that they would be interested in uh, what he was doing, and they had been interested, and they had taken some of his people. He said that that was the way they had been getting some money in the past, and... Uh, that now the government had said that they're going to have to go out and get some money on their own. That's why he was having to undertake this thing. As for the existence of the American Revolutionary Army, Murphy says it's still too early to tell. Sharon Lovejoy, CBS News, Atlanta. Sheriff's investigators north of San Francisco say they have not discovered a motive in the death of William Nolan, former California senator and publisher of the Oakland Tribune. Nolan's body was found near his summer home in Monterio on Saturday. The sheriff's office says that Nolan died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound in the head. Nolan did not leave any suicide note, and he was reported in good spirits last Thursday when he hosted a party at the newspaper office. More news in a minute. Young I may be, but still I'm a man. Just turned 18 and I'll do what I can to find me a place where I can be me. Get ready for life. about the new Navy. You'll get your chance at success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll-free 800-841-8000. That's 800-841-8000. Or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. I know where I'm going from here. An airplane carrying 32 American missionaries has landed in Akron after a weekend in Cuba. The plane was forced down in Cuba Saturday after the Havana government claimed it was flying too low in Cuban airspace. Cuba asked for and got $7,000 ransom for the plane's release. Exiled Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn spent the weekend in Norway looking at a house that he might buy in a little town called Lillehammer. Solzhenitsyn was the subject of discussion last night at a dinner in New York City. Phil Jones reports. Speaking at a B'nai Zion American-Israel friendship dinner, Vice President Ford said the United States is relieved that Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn has found a haven outside the Soviet Union. And said Ford, 
there is now renewed interest in the fate of Soviet writers and poets who voiced dissent within the Soviet Union. Our foreign policy, however, is based on a recognition that the United States and the Soviet Union share a special responsibility because of their nuclear power. We have always made clear that our search for a stable peace does not mean approval of a domestic system. Concerning the Middle East, Ford said, the administration remains committed to a military balance needed to preserve peace. Bill Jones, CBS News, with the Vice President in New York. The provisional wing of the outlawed Irish Republican Army claims responsibility for the death of a young man whose body was found Sunday night in a Catholic section of Londonderry. The extremist group says the man was executed for informing British soldiers about a secret ammunition dump belonging to the IRA. Earlier in the day, police announced they had caught the Belfast leader of the Army's provisional wing. A spokesman says that the capture of Ivor Bell was a tremendous coup and a shattering blow for the provisionals. Scotland Yard has called in Interpol, the international police group, to help search for thieves who stole a priceless painting over the weekend. The painting, by the 17th century Dutchman Vermeer, is worth an estimated $2.2 million, and it was taken from a mansion outside of London. The thieves reportedly used a sledgehammer to smash through the windows and an elaborate security system. This is Ann Crosman, CBS News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... E. G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear, but mostly to the world of terrifying imagination. The story you're about to hear concerns one of the most unusual killers in the annals of crime. A brutal murderer who carries not one but four deadly weapons wherever he goes. A huge monster of a creature weighing hundreds of pounds. But this isn't a horror story. In a way, it's a love story. It's called The Horse That Wasn't For Sale. And now that you've heard the title, you've already guessed the identity of our killer. But that doesn't mean you know what Stargazer is really like. No! No, you keep away from me, you hear? Get back, Stargazer! Get back! Get away! Please, stop it! Please, somebody, somebody stop him! Save me! Our mystery drama, The Horse That Wasn't For Sale, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slusser and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. Sam Spud, private investigator. Oh, Sam, I need you. Right around, Rita. Sam, I've been out all day. I tried. I really tried. Oh, well, yeah. But I couldn't sell one thing. And when I went back to the company, they said I bought the franchise and I was stuck with the goods. What am I going to do now, Sam? I'll help you, madam. You're not Sam. No, I'm the man from your Better Business Bureau. Always investigate the reputation of the company before you go into the franchise business. You won't become a millionaire overnight through buying a franchise. Believe me, that's true. Sam is wonderful. <laughs> Just another helpful tip from your Better Business Bureau. Bigger and better. Eastside Rental in Bellevue, the home of a thousand rental tools for the man who wants to do it himself around the yard or home. Eastside Rental's new facilities are ultra-modern, assuring you fast service and lots of parking right at their door. Located at 11830 Northeast 8th Bellevue, phone GL4-4088. 
For you contractors listening, Eastside Rental can help you with that extra heavy-duty equipment you don't want to invest your capital in. They'll fix you up right now. Call GL4-4088. Two locations to serve you, Midlakes on Bellevue-Redmond Road and in Redmond on the Fall City Highway. GL4-4088. They rent most everything, and they're open seven days a week. begins in an idyllic setting. Just picture the gently rolling hills of a horse farm in the early days of autumn. The colors of the trees all red in rust and differing shades of amber. See the ranch house nestled comfortably in the valley. The long row of white stables. But now you may notice something unusual about this farm. The stables are empty. No horses neigh and whinny in the paddocks. The only sound is the tapping of a typewriter. And at a desk in the front room sits a very handsome and very sad-looking young lady whose name is Chrissy Runyon. Judge Simmons, I thought it was only fair that I tell you the whole story about Stargazer eh? so that at least you'll know the animal isn't entirely to blame for what happened. It began on the day my father was buried. And of course it began with our trainer, Clem Burnett. He was all alone at Runyon Farms that day. And he took advantage of the fact to sample some of Daddy's best bourbon. <laughs> ah, shut up, you. Stand still if you want to get brushed. Ah, what's the matter with you? Stand still, you mangy beast. Ah, hello. Oh, for the love of her goes the blasted phone now. I ain't got one job to do, it's another. All right, all right. All right, all right, I'm coming. Hello. Mr. Burnett, it's Chrissy Runyon. Oh, hello, Miss Runyon. How is everything out there? Oh, everything's fine, just fine. What about Bobolink? Is she still off her feet? Ah, Bobolink's fine, just fine. Are you all right? Mr. Burnett. Sure, sure I am. Everything out here is just the way it should be. Uh, tell me, how was the funeral? I'm calling to ask about the horses, Mr. Burnett. Is Stargazer still restless? Well, that horse ain't been nothing but restless since the day he was foaled. Well, then don't trouble him, Mr. Burnett. Do you understand? Just let him be, and I'll take care of him when I get out there. Huh? You mean you're coming out? Of course I'm coming out. Why shouldn't I? Oh, no reason, no reason. I just thought, well... You ain't been here in a long time, Miss Runyon. Yes, well, I have to arrange things for the auction. Huh? Auction? What are you talking about? I'm sorry, Mr. Burnett, but the horses have to be sold. And the farm, too. My father's debts were, too. Uh... Well, never mind. I'll, I'll be there sometime this weekend. Oh, wait a minute. You're telling me that I'm out of a job? I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do about now, it. Now, look here. I've six years on this place. Six years and your old man never gave me more than a... I'll see you on the weekend, Mr. Burnett. And we'll settle then about your wages. And remember what I said about Stargazer. Just let him alone. Goodbye. Ah, just like that, huh? Just like that, huh, Miss Snooty? I let him alone, all right. He can starve as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> What's the matter, Stargazer? You don't look so happy today. Hungry, maybe, huh? Thirsty? No, there's no use pawing the ground. You just got to wait until she gets here. Miss Chrissy Runyon is the only one you ever cared for, right? Well, you can wait until she gets here and takes care of you, because I won't. <laughs> hey, now get down. Get down, Stargazer. Now you stop that. Ah, what are you trying to do? Knock down the whole barn? Now stop that. You stop it. All right, all right, if you want a taste of the whip. Now, now stop it. Stop it, you crazy beast. Get back there. Get back. You kicked me. No, no, no. 
Oh, my God! <laughs> Well, you know what happened to Clem Burnett better than I do, Judge Simmons. You viewed the remains of his body for the inquest. That was something I couldn't bring myself to do. I'm sure you remember the day after the hearing, when you asked me to dinner. Please, Judge, why don't you tell me what's really on your mind? It's about stargazer. Well, I appreciate your accepting this date. I know you're anxious to get back to the city. No, I'm anxious to get back to my home, Judge. Yes. It's hard to think that Runyon Farms isn't your home anymore. It hasn't been for years. You know that Daddy and I didn't get along. Yes, yes, I know that only too well. Your father used to say the only thing that keeps Chrissy coming back is that horse, Stargazer. Hmm. And you were right the first time. It's that horse. Yeah? What about it? Well, I think you know, Chrissy. Even though I handed down the verdict I did about poor Clem... Do you know what that man was doing to Stargazer? Yes, I heard testimony, remember? Well, it's the truth, Judge. He was deliberately starving the poor animal. He was depriving it of feed and water. And that's why Stargazer did what he did. Uh, Chrissy, Chrissy, stop thinking that animals are so aware of human motives. Well, I love horses, too, but well, I don't give them that much credit. Well, they know cruelty from kindness. And you think it was merely Burnett's cruelty that made Stargazer stomp him to death? Yes, I do. Then what about Clayton? Well, what about him? Clayton wasn't killed. Are you telling me that he wouldn't have been killed if your father hadn't reached the stable in time? I didn't know that you knew about Clayton. Your father told me himself. I didn't realize you... He swore me to secrecy because... Well, because he knew how much you loved Stargazer. He's my horse, Judge. Daddy gave him to me. Yes, but he didn't know that he was giving you a killer. Oh, don't say that. You can be glad I didn't say it at the inquest, Chrissy. Now, I was tempted to, let me tell you. It was only the fact of you sitting there with those big blue eyes of yours filled with tears. Oh, I was crying for my father. Yes, 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 of course. But you were crying for your stargazer, too. Now, you're afraid the verdict would be against the animal and that, that somebody would have to put a bullet in that proud head. Oh, Judge, please don't say such things. Chrissy, you're not going to allow stargazer to be sold, now, are you? Is that why you wanted this lunch, to ask me that? The horse cannot be ridden. Not even you would dare ride him again. A horse doesn't have to be ridden. Chrissy, your beautiful stallion is mad. Mad? Killer mad. The way some animals get when they're treated just a little too cruelly. But Stargazer wasn't ever treated that badly. Well, between Clayton and Burnett and you, you... Me? Yes, Chrissy. Yours was the greatest cruelty of all. What do you mean? Your horse loved you, child, and you left him. You went out of his life, and you stayed out of it. Well, I was in college, and afterwards... Well, Judge, I did have a life to live. I didn't want to live it under the thumb of my father. Yes, yes, and Stargazer forgot kindness and learned indifference and cruelty, and he went mad. Now, you have to do something for him. Judge, please listen to me. Now, I know he's valuable, Chrissy. I know your father left you with too many creditors, and Stargazer will probably bring you a higher price than any other horse on the list. Eight, maybe ten thousand from the stud farm. Judge Simmons, you needn't have worried. I made up my mind about that even before Stargazer... even before Burnett was killed. He's not for sale. You mean that, Chrissy? I'm putting every single horse up for auction, but not... Stargazer. Just a moment. Good morning. Oh. 
Hello. Well, you remember me, don't you? Alan Carlin from Wild Brook Farm? Yes, of course I remember you, Mr. Carlin. Why, well, I thought you might have forgotten me. It's been a couple of years since we've seen each other, Miss Runyon. I remember you. In fact, I saw you at the auction. Well, well, I'm flattered that you noticed me. You bought three of my father's horses. Yes, yes, I bought three. I, I meant to buy four. Uh, listen, do you mind if I, if I come in? Oh, please do. I, uh, I, I was really shocked when I heard he died. He wasn't a youngster, of course, but just the same. Well, my father was 71. Yeah, but I always figured he was younger, seeing as how he had such a young daughter. <laughs> but I know it took Will a long time to get around to marrying. He was practically 40 by then, wasn't he? But then, that's how your father was, always putting things off. Including paying his bills, huh? Is that why you're here, perhaps? I beg your pardon. No, I know that you are on my father's list of creditors. Oh, but that's that's not the reason I came to see you. You see, I bought three horses at your auction, but I meant to buy four. The only reason I didn't was because the horse I really wanted wasn't for sale. Huh. You mean Stargazer. Well, I, I suppose you think I believe those rumors about the animal? Well, I don't. I've been around horses all my life. A good thoroughbred doesn't go crazy overnight. So any compunction you might have about selling him... You're it... mistaken. Stargazer was kept out of the auction at my request. He's my horse, and I don't want him sold. Well, I attended the inquest, you know. I, I listened to every word, and I know Burnett mistreated the animal. That's why he got stopped. Mr. Burnett was a fine trainer. Oh, yes, 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 indeed. The point is that I'm willing to take my chances, Miss Runyon. I won't ask you to cut the price because of a horse's reputation. There's no price tag on him. I'm sorry. Uh, Miss Runyon, you're still a sporting woman, aren't you? Would you be willing to make a, a little wager? What? Well, I've ridden horses with reputations five times worse than stargazers, and I can prove it. Now, if I do, will you talk about a sale? No. <laughs> oh, you're your father's daughter, all right. Everybody said Will ought to raise mules that would have been more in character. Now, look, you don't have to worry about me. I was born in a saddle. If anything happens, a responsibility will be all mine. Your responsibility? Do you really think I care what happens to you? Yeah, but nothing will. If you were at that inquest, you know what it means if Stargazer hurts anybody again. They'll destroy him, and they'll have the legal right to put him away. And I won't let that happen. But it won't be that way. It will. There is something wrong with Stargazer. I've known that for a long time. And I think Daddy knew it, too, but he gave him to me thinking that I might win him over with kindness. Well, I failed, you see. And now when he feels that hateful weight on his back, he... Oh, please, please go, Mr. Carlin, please. All right, Miss Runyon. I'm just so terribly sorry you won't let me prove you wrong. Start my packing. Feels like the whole morning is gone. Oh, no. I hope that man isn't bothering Stargazer. We must be out at the stable. Mr. Carlin, don't. Please don't. Mr. Carlin, don't. Mr. Carlin, stop. Bring him back here. Don't ride him. And so Mr. Alan Carlin, horse fancier, has taken a fancy to a killer horse. But Mr. Carlin won't admit he can't win Stargazer's heart and perhaps win Stargazer himself. We'll find out what becomes of both of them when I return shortly with Act Two. When you feel like having a cold Budweiser, do you automatically reach for a glass? Well, sure, Bud's a great beer any way you drink it. But without a glass, you're really missing something. 
Now take that wonderful Budweiser head of foam, for instance. Those bubbles, tiny though they are, still amount to something pretty special at the top of your glass. Taste appeal and eye appeal. Two results of exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation. It takes a lot longer to brew Budweiser that way. But brewing beer right does make a difference that you can taste. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've really said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. new home sure would be great with cool green lawn and nice white gate. Wherever they be, the kids will know they've got a place to always go. Everyone's got a right to dream. It's great when you can make it. Buy U.S. savings bonds today and see those dreams come true. Everyone's got a right to dream, and this is how you make it. Join payroll savings where you work for U.S. Savings Bond. And now, here's Act Two of The Horse That Wasn't For Sale. Alan Carlin knows horses, knows the feel of them, the moods of them, knows when they respond to a rider's touch, and knows when they resent it. But there are times when even the best horseman allows his ego to override his common sense. And Alan Carlin is about to learn that his time is now. Okay, boy. Take it easy now. Easy. Throw it down, boy. Come on. Those branches. Oh, good Lord, Stargazer. Throw it down, boy. <laughs> that tree. No. Oh. oh, God, my back. My spine. <laughs> crazy horse, she was right. You are crazy. No, 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 no. You keep away from me. Get back. You get back there, Stargazer. You get away, get away! Don't stop it! Somebody, please, somebody, stop him! Save me! Police department. Hello. I want to report it. I want to report a missing animal. A horse. Uh, who is this, please? Uh, my name is Runyon, Christine Runyon. Oh, yes, Miss Runyon. This is Sergeant Beggs. Oh, Sergeant, one of my horses was removed from... I mean, uh, he ran away. Oh? I thought all your animals were auctioned off, Miss Runyon. No. No, there's one that wasn't sold. His name is... Listen, maybe he's still around the farm somewhere. Maybe I'd better just go out and look for him. Well, if you want to give me a description of the animal... No, be... no, no, it's all right. I just... Lost my head for a minute. I'm sure he's around the property somewhere, and I'll find him. But don't worry. Um, whatever you say, miss. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to have troubled you. Goodbye. Of course, I knew that Stargazer wasn't around the farm. I knew where Stargazer was. Somewhere near the woods with Alan Carlin on his back, if he was still safely in the saddle. And I knew that I had to find them. I saw Carlin's automobile parked outside, and I decided to take it instead of my own, so that I could send Mr. Carlin back where he belonged. I just hoped and prayed that I wasn't too late. I 
hated driving. All my life I preferred a saddle to a driver's seat. But I drove Alan Carlin's car like a reckless idiot, taking every curve as if it was a race course. Stargazer must have been traveling swiftly because there was still no sign of them when the road ended and became a forest trail. Only a horse could travel that pathway. So I stopped the car. I wasn't afraid of the forest. I'd spent half my life on a trail that led into the deepest parts of it. But now for the first time I felt afraid of it. Afraid of what it might conceal. And then I heard a sound that froze me in my tracks. Stargazer! Stargazer, where are you? Stargazer! Mr. Carlin! Oh, thank heavens you're all right, Stargazer. You are. Oh, dear God. No! Mr. Carlin, he's been thrown. Oh, I warned you not to do this. He just won't be ridden. Nobody can ride Stargazer, not even me. You're lucky you weren't... Oh, no. Oh, no, his head. Oh, no. <laughs> you killed him. He's dead. He samples to death. Oh, dear God, how could you let this happen? It isn't right. It isn't right. No, 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 Stargazer. I'm not angry. Not with you. My poor animal. No, it's his fault. It's all his fault. Oh, damn you, Carlin. Why did you make this happen? Why? No, don't. Don't worry. Don't worry, Stargazer. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. That wouldn't be fair. It just wouldn't be. Only what can I do? They'll find out. Somebody will find out. <laughs> I looked at Carlin's dead body. And I thought, what if I simply left it there? Just left it to yesterday's dead leaves and this year's snow. By the time they found him, Stargazer would be safe with me in Washington. But then I realized that would never work. They'd see the hoof marks on his face. They'd know. That policeman I called would remember, and they'd come for Stargazer, and they'd put a bullet in his head. No. No, I couldn't leave Alan Carlin there. Not with the story of his death so clearly marked on his face and his body. Well, maybe there was something else I could do. What if I obscured the story of that death? What if I just obliterated it? Yes, that was my answer. Helen Carlin's automobile was only a hundred yards away. If I could get him there, I, I bent down and put my hands under his arms. And I tried to lift him. He was so heavy. Dead weight. How, how could I drag him to the car? No, it was impossible. I could only move him a few inches along the ground. The slippery leaves beneath his body helped a little, but I just didn't have the strength. And then Stargazer gave me the answer. If I could manage to secure the body to his harness, if I could attach it somehow to the reins, or even to the stirrup... It was horrible, I knew that. But the thought of what might happen to Stargazer was even more horrible, more unbearable. And finally... <laughs> finally... I managed it. I dragged that man's body out of the woods, using Stargazer as my strength. And, and I put Alan Carlin into his own automobile. And I started the engine. There was only one logical place to take him. It was the canyon road, of course. I knew how steep that drive was, how dangerous it was. That's why so few cars traveled it. And that was lucky for me, the fact that the road was empty, because it made what I had to do so much easier. It almost seemed like a sign from heaven that what I was doing was right. And then, at the beginning of a steep grade, I stopped the car. And I looked at 
the edge of the precipice. And then I looked at Alan Carlin's body. And for a moment, my nerve deserted me. But then I put down the parking brake. I shifted the car into drive. And I got out. And I reached below the dashboard and released the handbrake. And for a moment, I thought I'd have to push the car to start it sliding down the grade toward the edge. But then gravity became my confederate, and the car began to move of its own accord. The door slammed shut as the wind caught it, and with gathering momentum, it headed straight for the guardrail, straight for the canyon below. And the guardrail gave way, and the car and the man and the whole horrible problem went over the edge. And when it struck the bottom, the impact was so shattering, I knew that Stargazer could never possibly be implicated in that man's death. <coughs> then I made the long walk back to the woods, back to my horse, to my old friend, who stood patiently tethered, waiting for me, trusting in me. Sergeant Beggs. Oh, uh, you, yes, Sergeant. Well, I just thought I'd call and see if you had any luck about uh, finding your horse, I mean. Oh, uh, yes, I, I found him. I uh, was foolish to have panicked. He, he hadn't gone very far after all. Oh, good, good. Still on the property, you mean? Yes, huh? yes, 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 he was. That was silly of me. He was just a short distance away. Well, that's fine. That's just fine. I'm glad to hear it. Better make sure you keep that uh, stable door locked, huh? uh, Yes, I will. Um, uh, thank you very much, Sergeant. You're welcome, Miss Runyon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh. I think I could use a drink. Oh, no. No, what? Hello. Uh, hello, is this Miss, um, is, is it, uh, Bunyan? No, the name is Runyon. Who is this? Well, uh, you wouldn't know me, Miss Bunyan. I mean, uh, Miss Runyon. Name's Sam Fryant. I work over at Wildwood Farm for uh, Mr. Carlin, you know. Yes. Oh, what do you want? Well, I was wondering if you were going to be home this afternoon, Miss Runyon. A little something I wanted to talk to you about. No, I'm sorry. I have a great number of things to do today. I can't receive visitors. Well, I, I figured you'd want to talk to me, Miss Runyon, on account of uh, what happened this morning. Oh. What do you mean? I think you know what happened out there on that canyon road. I haven't the faintest idea of what you're talking about. Uh, sure you do, Miss Runyon. You see, I saw you kill Mr. Carlin out there. I saw you murder him. Now, can I come and talk to you? <laughs> There's a famous old saying that we've all become familiar with lately. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. At the moment, it looks as if Chrissy Runyon has woven herself a tangled web and one in which she herself seems to be caught. But we'll learn exactly how tangled her affairs are when we return shortly with Act Three. And now another tale of the ball and chain. <coughs> Presents the good, the bad, and the heavy. Why is that cowboy wearing a ball and chain? Because carrying around extra pounds can be just like carrying around a ball and chain. How symbolic. Well, it is, senor. Give me the special K breakfast. Here you go. For a special K, it's the milk, orange juice, and coffee. Ah. Say, don't I know you from some place? You probably don't recognize me with my ball and chain. I used to be 10 pounds lighter, but I'm getting back that way by exercising and eating smart at every meal. Starting with this year's special K breakfast. What's so special? It's less than 240 calories, 99% fat free, and delicious. It's going to help me get rid of this year's ball and chain. I bet your horse will be glad to get out. Another ball and chain fights the dust. 
Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. That's Kellogg's Special K. That's right. Good night. To a child who doesn't read, the world is a closed book. Drifting, dropping back, dropping out. That's why a nationwide organization named RIF, Reading is Fundamental, was formed. To help get books into the hands of children who have no books of their own. A book a child can pick out for himself, for keeps. A book that really belongs to him and makes him want to read. It works. There are more than 150 local RIF programs starting up in communities like yours. They're proving that once you get a child into books, there's no stopping him. Won't you help? Write to Riff Incorporated, that's R-I-F, care of Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C., 20560. the final act of the horse that wasn't for sale. And it begins with a sound that strikes terror into the heart of young Chrissy Runyon. She hesitates before she answers it, afraid of the man who might be on her doorstep. Miss Runyon? Yes. I'm, uh, Sam Fry. Yes. Oh. Come in. Well, it's, uh, Nice of you to see me, Miss Runyon. Who are you, Mr. Fryatt? I've never seen you around here before. Well, I'm new, Miss Runyon. I, I come from out of state. Yeah, I used to work in West Virginia at the Algonquin Farm. You know it? I heard of it. Yeah, well, I used to be a trainer there a long, long time ago. Then they had me doing grooming work and junk like that. I, I said no more of that, I said. Mr. Fryatt, will you please come to the point? What did you mean about Mr. Carlin? I don't know what you saw or think you saw. I seen you, Miss Runyon. I seen what you did. Well, whatever you think you saw, you were mistaken. I didn't even know your boss, Mr. Carlin. And to accuse me of killing him... Oh, but that's what you did, all right. Now, you pushed that car over the cliff and poor Mr. Carlin was in it. My, my, you, you must have really hated that man. Well, what'd they ever do to you? Uh, get fresh or something? Mr. Fryatt, you're completely wrong. I swear you're mistaken. Well, all righty then, I'm wrong. So you don't mind if I tell the police what I saw? Now, I figure they're not so dumb they can go looking for footprints or something up there, like tire tracks and stuff like that. It, it, it was an accident. Of course, sir. I don't have to tell them what I saw. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, what I said. Ain't no law saying a man has to tell everything he knows. And what would stop you? Oh, if I liked a person. No, that's not what you really mean, is it? Now, you take Mr. Carlin. Well, I only worked for the man a week, and I could tell already that he wasn't such a nice fella. Now, he... I did not kill Mr. Carlin. Oh, sure, Miss Runyon. But you see, there I was in that canyon... <gasps> Taking a ride on the old nag they let me use, and I seen that car stop there. And now, just for the heck of it, I put my field glasses on it. <laughs> That's how I come to see it all. But you don't understand why I did it. Oh, heck, I don't care why. Now, I told you I didn't like the man. Mm, sure could sit a horse, though. Now, I'll give him that. I swear to you, he was already dead. You know, people around here know that he treated your pa pretty bad. <laughs> Can't blame you for what you did. No, you I... must believe me. Mr. Carlin was already dead when his car went over into the canyon. He'd been killed by... by an accident. Now, I had my reasons for doing what I did. Sure, Miss Shore, you did. And you can just tell the police all about it. No, no, they may not understand. Yeah, yeah that's true enough. Yeah, they may not understand. I mean, not the way I do. But just the same, if they ask me questions about it, now, I'd have to tell them what I know. Well, unless, of course, uh, I wasn't around to tell them anything. Not around? 
Well, with Mr. Carlton dead, there's not much point in me hanging around Wildbrook much longer. Maybe I ought to move on. You know, find me another job. If I did that, well, <laughs> I wouldn't be here when the police came around. Understand? No, I'm not sure I do. <sighs> if I could get me a stake, now, I'd leave right away, tomorrow, maybe. That wouldn't take much. Four, five thousand, maybe, huh? That ought to be enough, uh, don't you think? Oh, now, wait a minute. Well, be better round it out to five. Eh, yeah, five thousand would do her, Miss Runyon. Do you expect me to give you that money? Well, sure help if you did. But that's impossible. I don't have a penny. You know, auction must have given you plenty, Miss Runyon. Why, Mr. Carlin bought some of your stock himself. But uh, every cent goes to my father's creditors. And even that won't be enough. Well, I don't know about that. All I know is five thousand would do me just fine. Now, you think it over, Miss Runyon. <laughs> I'll come back tomorrow afternoon. It won't do any good. We'll see. There's just no way I can raise that money, Mr. Fry. Oh, you'll find some way. Women these days, they can do just about everything. You know, fly airplanes, run companies, kill people. <laughs> well, you'll figure something out, Miss Runyon. Well, so long now. No, ma'am, ma 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 Mr. Fry, please. I'll... I'll see you in the morning. Oh, dear God. What am I going to do? <laughs> News on the local scene. The body of horseman Alan Winslow Carlin has been found in the ravine below Canyon Road. Carlin, the victim of an auto crash that completely demolished his vehicle, had to be identified positively through examination of his dental records due to the condition of the body. An investigation by the State Highway Patrol is underway. Yes. Uh, Miss Runyon, my name is Sergeant Beggs. We, uh, spoke on the phone earlier today. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Could I please come in? Well, if you're still worried about my horse, I told you that I did find him again. Oh, yes, yes, Miss, I know. Well, then, what's the trouble? Oh, nothing about the horse. It's, uh, about your neighbor, as a matter of fact. It, if I could just, uh, come in for a minute, please. Yes, of course. Thank you. I don't know if you, uh, know the gentleman. Name of Carlin? Oh, yes, I know who he is. Wildbrook Farm. Yes, that's him. Matter of fact, I understand he uh, bought some of your horses at the auction last week. Yes, he did, but I uh, didn't handle the transaction myself. The auctioneer did all of that. Yes, yes, I understand. Well, then, what was it you wanted to ask me? Uh, you haven't been back home for some time, have you? It's close to two years. I came here when my father died suddenly. Yes, I know. And so I guess you uh, didn't see Alan Carlin in all that time? No. <laughs> Why in the world should I? Oh, I was just asking. Oh, Sergeant, I think you'd better tell me what this is all about. Well, I've got something to tell you about Mr. Carlin. He's, uh, he's dead. He died in an auto crash this morning. Yes. Yeah. I just heard that on the news. Oh, I see, I see. Well, it was pretty bad. He was halfway up the canyon road, heading for the Leap. You know where the Leap is? Sergeant, I was born and raised in this part of the country. Oh, yes, of course. Excuse me. Anyway, he went out driving that way, and he must have skidded or something. Car went over the edge, plowed right through the guardrail. Oh, that's terrible. It's such a dangerous road. Oh, yes, yes, it is a dangerous place. I would have thought Mr. Carlin would have had more sense than to take it at high speed or whatever it was he did. Anyway, the car went over, and it was totally demolished, of course, and that's uh, a long way down. Oh, that poor man. I'm terribly sorry about Mr. Carlin. But I really can't take his loss very personally. I hardly knew the man. Uh-huh. Uh, your father knew him well, though, didn't he? Uh, yes. They were neighbors for many years. And friends. Oh, I suppose so. Only they had some kind of falling out about money, I understand. Well, what does that have to do with all this? Just curious, Miss Runyon. Are you trying to imply something? <laughs> no, no, miss, of course not. Why should I do that? Oh, uh... There is just one more thing, though, one more thing. When Mr. Carlin left his place this morning, he told one of his servants that he was coming here to see you. Oh, uh, that's right. 
he was here. Mm -hmm. What time would that have been? Oh, I don't remember exactly. Around 11, I think. Did he stay very long? No, no. No more than 10 minutes. I, I don't see the point of all these questions. Well, you see, we're just trying to understand what happened, Miss Runyon. Mr. Carlin, he was a pretty careful driver. He knew that mountain road as good as anyone else in this part of the country. And we were just wondering if he might have been, well, oh, let's say overtired or drinking too much or depressed, you know, anything like that. Um, how did he seem to you? Mm, I, I, I just don't recall. I see. Well, then I guess that's all for now. What do you mean, for now? Oh, the highway patrol is investigating the accident, too, and since you were the last person to see Mr. Carlin, they might be talking to you, too, Miss Runyon. <laughs> oh, is that the horse out there, one that got away? Yes, that's my horse. My, my, my. That's a fine-looking animal. Oh. I guess he's the only one. You didn't sell off, huh? That's right. The only one, Sergeant. But, uh... I, I might not keep him, after all. Well, hello, Miss Ryan. Hello, Mr. Fryer. Come in. Well, thank you, thank you. Well... Sure, a nice morning we had one in, huh? I didn't notice. <laughs> sure, glad it warmed up some. <laughs> I had a walk over from Mr. Carlin's place. <laughs> that old nag of mine finally broke down. <laughs> hmm. Coffee I smell? Yes. Oh. Would you like a cup? <laughs> well, I sure wouldn't mind. How do you take it? Uh, black, just fine. Oh, thank you, miss. That's real nice of you. <sighs> ah, that's good. <laughs> Well, now, I understand the police were around yesterday. You don't miss very much, do you, Mr. Fryer? Pays to keep your eyes open, I say. Oh, yes, I'm sure it does. Now, the question is, how much does it pay? Mr. Fryer, I don't have the money you want. Well, that's real bad piece of news, Miss Runyon. I told you yesterday there's simply no way for me to get my hands on it. The money that came to the estate through the sale of the ranch and its stock went directly into escrow. Now, now I wouldn't know about fancy words like that, miss. All I know the is The estate I... has no money. And I have no money of my own. Well, that's really too bad. Because that means I can't leave. And if I can't leave, I might just as well tell the police what I saw. I'm hoping that you don't do that, Mr. Fryer. Oh, I don't want to do it. Believe me, Miss Runyon. But if there was just, just something you could give me. I mean, there must be something your pa left you, huh? man like your daddy wouldn't die and leave his only child nothing at all. Well, there is one thing. Uh, what's that? It's the only legacy I have. The most valuable thing he owned. Look, out the window. That horse, you mean? Yes. His name is Stargazer. A thoroughbred. A champion. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's some stallion, all right. You said you were a good judge of horse flesh. How much do you think he's worth? Well, I wouldn't know for sure. I've I... been told he's worth between eight and ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Hey, a man would be mighty proud to own a horse like that, right? Well... He's all yours, Mr. Fryer. What? I'll transfer my ownership to you. Right this minute. Oh, you... You really mean that? Oh, why, that would be real fine, Miss Runyon. That, that would be real kind of you to do that. It won't take more than a few minutes for me to prepare the papers. Oh, I'd really appreciate that, Miss Runyon. You know, I'd sure like to take him out for one last ride before the sun goes down. And, of course, that's just what happened, Judge Simmons. Sam Fryatt took Stargazer out for his very last ride. <laughs> Remember?
Remember all the old cowboy movies that showed the Lone Rider heading into the setting sun? Well, you can picture old Sam Fryatt doing exactly that. Only when the words that say, the end, appear on the screen, you can also be sure they mean the end of old Sam Fryatt. I'll be back shortly. Poverty to me is not just a lack of money. Poverty is a lack of power. We want to try to see whether it's possible to live in the city. Whether or not it's possible to share life, you know, on a city street. The give and take of city living is what you might call it. Whether or not we could bring people together to begin to work together and confront the problems that are all our problems. I think really that the problems that people face in life can be solved. You don't need someone from outside to do it. And you really don't need a great deal of money to do it. What you do need is a lot of people who recognize that they have the ability to do something about the problem. Not by themselves, maybe, but working together and sharing their talents and their ideas. Together they can confront the problems and overcome them. That's what the Campaign for Human Development is all about. Campaign for Human Development, United States Catholic Conference. you enjoyed this radio mystery story we hope you're enjoying the magic of radio itself magic which produces the most gigantic stage of all a stage large enough for one galloping horse or an entire herd of galloping horses this is E.G. Marshall asking you to tune in right will someone please head those horses off at the pass our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Arnold Moss, William Redfield, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. They'll never be satisfied. But we got him out of the country. What's to keep him from coming back when he's broke or even threatening us from abroad? I gave him a thousand dollars in cash only a few days ago. When he was picked up in the bar, he had only about 270-some dollars left. In a matter of two days, he'd squandered over 700. But if he were made to understand that the sum agreed on was all he was going to Can get... I make you understand? We're not dealing with a rational, honest man. He'll agree to anything. When his money runs out or he decides he wants more, he'll... he'll be right back. What can you do? There are only... Two things one can do about a black man. I keep on paying and paying forever. And the other? And the other? Kill him. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. energy chief says he thinks the tight gasoline situation is going to loosen up quickly. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. Energy chief William Simon predicts that many long lines at service stations will start getting shorter and that gasoline rationing will not be needed even when Americans start their summer vacations. Simon also says President Nixon is deeply concerned about the hardships the gasoline shortage is causing Americans. 
but that the president remains firmly opposed to rationing. Simon told why the administration has been so reluctant to resort to rationing. Basically, we believe that since the World War II experience of gasoline rationing, that our society has become a great deal more complex. We have almost 100 million automobiles today in this country versus under 23 million with obviously many more licensed drivers. We have a massive suburbia where people must drive to work each day that have no mass transit system, etc. We think that there again, through the allocation method, we can get the necessary supplies out to these people without imposing this burden. Simon appeared on NBC's Meet the Press. Just six hours from now, Secretary of State Kissinger will be off on another overseas diplomatic mission. Kissinger will be stopping in London before going to the Middle East, where he'll try to negotiate a troop pullback between Syria and Israel, whose armies are facing each other and frequently clashing along the Syrian front. After the stop in London, Kissinger will go to Syria for talks with President Assad, and then to Israel for discussions with Prime Minister Golda Meir. The Shah of Iran says the United States is importing at least as much oil now as it was last September before the Arab embargo started. Interviewed on the CBS News broadcast 60 Minutes, the Shah said some fraud, something is going on. He says ships are changing destinations two or three times in the oceans. The oil industry would dispute this. The American Petroleum Institute says oil imports are down 25% from last November. More news after this message. If you're wondering where to turn for information on conserving energy this winter, you'll find lots of help in the latest edition of the Consumer Information Index. The index is published four times a year by the Consumer Product Information Center, part of the General Services Administration. And the index lists the latest and best consumer information from the federal government. For your free copy of the index, Write Consumer Information, Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. Skydiving will take your breath away, but you'll get it back! Jumping into an ice-cold stream will take your breath away, but it'll come back! Emphysema will take your breath away, but only proper medication and treatment will help get it back. If you have the symptoms of emphysema, shortness of breath, labored breathing, see your doctor right away. This reminder from your Tuberculosis and Respiratory Disease Association is a matter of life and breath. In China, the attack against Confucius goes on and has been joined by the nation's number two man. Don Webster has a report from Hong Kong. Premier Zhou Enlai has become the first high official in China to join in the criticism of Confucius. His public statement tends to discredit one theory of China watchers, that the anti-Confucius campaign is actually aimed at Joe himself. The premier's reference to Confucius came at one of the few public appearances he's making these days, a Sunday night banquet in Peking for the visiting president of Zambia, K.D. Kaunda. In his speech, Joe continued the practice of linking Confucius with former defense minister Lin Piao, Lin dead two and a half years, Confucius 2,500 years. Joe called them both reactionaries who tried to turn back the wheel of history. This criticism, plus some other criticism of things Western, have looked to some as a veiled attack on Zhou Enlai's foreign policy. But now, Joe is one of the attackers. Don Webster, CBS News, Hong Kong. For centuries, Confucius was revered in China, but now the nation's political factions may be using some of his teachings and ideas to promote their own ends. 